<coughs> Sorry about that. Kia ora tato. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming on this uh, incredibly dreary day. Um, it's wonderful to see so many familiar faces um, for what's going to be a, a really interesting and stimulating talk. So thank you. Oh, hi Margaret. Thanks so much for coming again. Um, I'll uh, formally introduce Brett in a minute, um, but um, I'm going to hand over to the president of the Tauranga Historical Society in, in just a couple of minutes. Just to say a few remarks from me. Um, this today remarks the second of our um, combined um, uh, audience of, of Tauranga Historical Society members and ALMS Foundation um, whānau uh, gatherings, which is excellent. Um, great to have everyone together in one place um, for hearing interesting talks. Um, and we hope to do that more in the future. Um, and uh, the format of today will be, obviously, Brett's talk, and then afterwards, everyone's welcome to come over to the Fensible Cottage over there for a cup of tea and a biscuit. So we hope you stay for that. So I will hand over to Julie now, and then I'll, it'll come back to me, and I'll introduce Brett. <coughs> So I too would like to welcome you all on this terrible day. You very dedicated history people. Um, now, three things I want to say. Um, one is I have two apologies from members. One is a stalwart called Peg Cummins and one of our committee members, Alistair Melvin, asked me to give his apologies if we didn't make it today. Um, the second thing I'd like to say is to give a very warm welcome to Roz and Nick Entham who have come over from Paturangi. They are actually indirectly relatives of Don Kinders, uh, related to his sister, is that right? Yes, it's through you, Nick. Yeah, yeah. I always have trouble remembering. I have written it down somewhere at home, but yes, it's not in the front of my mind. Um, and the third thing is I have brought um, two lovely books that my husband and I own about John Kinder's work if anybody wants to look through those at any stage later. All right? So, um, thank you very much. Thanks, Julie. Okay, folks. Um, Brett Payne is a photo historian who has worked with uh, photographic collections in Tauranga and at other institutions around New Zealand. Over the last couple of years, he has been researching the early photographs taken by John Kinder in the Bay of Plenty and hunting down original prints and collections from Auckland through to Dunedin. He presented a summary of his early research to the Kinder Society in Auckland last year, and he's going to talk to us today on Kinder's connections with this particular area and his significant contribution to our understanding of the landscape in Tauranga, particularly in the 1860s. So please join me in welcoming Brett. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you, Andrew and uh, Julie, for the opportunity to speak today. Um, by way of background, I work in the museum industry, and uh, although my speciality is uh, photo history, I do quite a variety of other work as well. Um, I've been writing about old photographs uh, on my blog, Photo Sleuth, for about a decade and uh, for several years have been collecting together images and information as part of a, a project about photographers in the Bay of Plenty uh, between the 1860s and the 1930s. Um, society members may, be, uh, may recall uh, several of my articles about Tauranga photog photographers uh, which uh, published on the um, Society blog and uh, in the Historical Review. Um, over the last year or two, I was asked by the Elms and the Tauranga Heritage Collection to help with the rehousing of uh, archival documents and artefacts in the Elms Collection. And while doing so, I came across several photographs by uh, John Kinder um, of, of this area. And although I was aware of uh, uh, Reverend Kinder's connection to Tauranga at the time, and, and his photography. Um, I had a look on the internet, uh, did a little cursory exploration of, of, of his, his work, and uh, didn't 
didn't reveal much except a very confused picture of, of, of what, it, what he was responsible for. So um, this prompted further research, which, as often happens, uh, <laughs> led me astray and down a rather deep rabbit hole. Anyway, uh, after considerable research of, of online catalogues, uh, museum catalogues, of which there are many, most uh, museums these days have very good online catalogues and, and more and more of their material is being digitized. So you can do a lot of your research from, from home. Um, and previous literature, uh, I viewed um, a huge array of, of original kinder prints um, traveling uh, in, in person, traveling uh, to Auckland, where I looked at the Sir George, Sir George Gray collection in the Auckland Library, um, the Auckland Art Gallery, Auckland War Memorial Museum, um, Auckland University Library as well, uh, at Te Papa, um, at the Auckland at the uh, Alexander Turnbull Library in Wellington, uh, the Hocken Collection at the University of Otago in Dunedin, as well as a number of original and copy prints in the Tauranga Library and in the Tauranga Heritage Collection. And uh, of previous studies done on Kinder's uh, paintings and photographs, the most important are Michael Dunn's comprehensive 1984 study um, and Ron Branson's 2004 Book, both of which Julie has very kindly uh, brought today, and uh, you'll be able to have a look at those uh, after the talk. Um, as well as detailed catalogues, particularly in the Dunn book, that's the larger of the two, um, uh, and, and a very informed discussion of the work, um, they also have a huge number of excellent reproductions, uh, both of, of paintings and photographs. I've also been fortunate enough to view scans made of a series of photographs by Kinder, which were discovered recently in Basel, Switzerland, uh, by Sasha Nolden, who's a researcher who works at the Alexander Turnbull Library. Um, now, although my focus today is, is primarily on his photography, let me... Sorry, I should have been on that one before. That gives an idea of the, of the resources I've used. Um, the institutions I've been to and the various um, literature that I've been using. So although my focus today is primarily on his photography, uh, I'm going to provide a little bit of, of background to those who may not be very familiar with his connection to the Elms. So he was born in London in, in 1819 and educated in the classics uh, with lessons in French and drawing. Uh, and studied mathematics at uh, Trinity College, Cambridge. And then in 1846, he was ordained a deacon. Uh, during uh, his uh, late teens and early 20s, he traveled uh, to the continent several times, and uh, while there, exercised his talents by sketching and uh, painting scenes uh, of the places he visited. Um, this watercolour view of Lago di Como in Italy uh, was painted around 1845, so he would have been uh, 26 at the time. And it's painted in, in a, a style um, which would become his characteristic style, very characteristic. Um, as a, after a brief spell working as a, a curate in a poor London parish, uh, he spent eight years teaching at a grammar school in, in the English Midlands. Uh, and then, for various reasons, uh, decided to emigrate to New Zealand, arrived here with his widowed mother and his sister in uh, 1855. Uh, now aged 36, he had been appointed uh, a master of the Church of England Grammar School in Auckland. Um, and his first years were pretty busy. Um, he... he um, Apart from teaching, he su supplemented his income by acting as chaplain to the troops based around Auckland, and he conducted services at St. Mark's in Remera. But in his spare time, he explored the countryside, did a lot of walking. Uh, he was mostly on foot and, and recorded his expeditions, as usual, uh, with sketches and paintings. He 
later wrote in his memoirs, sketching from nature became my favorite amusement and was kept up till old age as my numerous books and portfolios will testify. This is an example in 1856, which is a year after he arrived, um, Mahurangi, uh, north of Auckland. Um, painted in the summer of 1856. Summer being significant because the school holidays were the only times that he could walk any distance, uh, travel any distance, and, and uh, were the only real times that he had time to paint, and later to exercise his, his uh, hobby of, of photography. So that was 1856. The following summer, he set out for the Bay of Plenty by boat, accompanied by uh, a pupil of his, Arthur Gundry. He was, they were intending to visit what was then known as the Hot Lake, Lakes District around uh, Rotorua uh, and Rotomohana. But when they reached Tauranga, they learned that they wouldn't be able to um, find the necessary guides to, to take them overland uh, to Rotorua until after the Christmas holidays because everyone had gone home. So uh, Archdeacon Brown, Brown very uh, kindly put them up at Tapapa. Um, uh, and he stayed here for about 10 days. And during this, these 10 days, Kenda sketched and paid, painted a number of scenes, including this pen and ink sketch uh, and a watercolour of a similar view. So um, those of you in the audience who are guides or familiar with the garden may realise that uh, uh, this watercolour here is painted from a spot just outside the northern gate of the property in roughly that direction, um, where there is actually a seat still to this day. Uh, number 11, is it, that's right there. So it's kind of on, on the boundary with number 11. You can sit there and you can look at this exact same view. Do you think well, there really was a peacock? <laughs> previous slide. Pro probably, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> So this view is now, sadly, rather spoiled by shipping containers, but you can still get an idea of what it might have looked like, and you can correlate this with what you can see now. Uh, in late December or early January, uh, Kinder and Gundry proceeded to, Rotorua to the Rotoro district on foot with the guides, making numerous paintings and sketches uh, before returning to Auckland. So it was, of course, during this visit that Kinder met Celia Brown, and he was clearly quite taken with her, and presumably she with him, um, as he took advantage of the next opportunity available to him and paid another visit to Tapapa during the July 1858 school holidays. <laughs> he stayed with uh, the Volkners uh, in, in uh, their cottage near the Elms for about 10 days, the Volkners being... Uh, uh, Reverend Faulkner being uh, Archdeacon Brown's assistant at the time. So they stayed with him. He stayed with them for about 10 days and spent a good deal of time in the company of Celia, walking, painting, reading poetry, and making an excursion across the harbour to climb Moal. Eventually, Celia's father gave his consent to their marriage a year later in August 1859, and then four months later in December, uh, they tied the knot in the Tapapa Mission Chapel, the predecessor to this building, uh, which we're sitting in now, of course. For their honeymoon, they travelled uh, on horseback over the Kaimais, uh, using the Wairiri Falls route to Matamata. Uh, and this is, this is the way they would have come. They would have come across the Kaimais and down, down the slope here, uh, and then on to, to Matamata. Uh, then to Topuri and, and back to Auckland. So that gives a background to his artistic endeavours and to why he had the connection uh, with, with uh, Tauranga. So it's not known exactly when Kinder first took up photography, but it's likely that the first surviving examples of his work uh, are, are a number of undated small format stereo views, which I've shown here. Uh, mainly of the Auckland region, taken around 1861. 
So that's uh, about uh, a year and a half uh, or so after, after the, he was married to Celia. So these two stereographs from the Uni Auckland University Special Collections show Pinder's house in uh, uh, Air Street in Parnell, uh, which is, still exists today, and it is in fact the home of the Kinder Society. So intriguingly, uh, for the card mount in the first stereo view, he's actually used, recycled an old watercolor that he, he did, uh, cut, cut it up, and uh, you can see the same house picture in, in, in that watercolor. But that's true. He often used um, uh, recycled old card, like business cards and all sorts of things for, the, for uh, photo photographic card mounts. So in the spring of 1862, uh, Kinder accompanied uh, assistant surgeon Dr. William Temple on a trip south of Auckland and produced a series of photographs of military encampments and soldiers building roads between Drury and the Waikato. So uh, this was a period when the soldiers were, when Cameron's road building activities were going on and, and the soldiers were working further and further south um, towards uh, Mangatafri. Um, these photographs were larger format than, format than his previous stereo views, so he obviously had a different ca camera. It's been suggested by Ron Brownson that he actually borrowed um, uh, Dr. Temple's uh, camera. It's not clear exactly what, uh, whether, he, whether he had brought a, brought a new camera or was, was borrowing one, because the format of these is different again from something that he produced a little while later. Um, on the evening of 13th of December 1862, John and Celia arrived at Tapapa on board the Julia for a stay of a little over a month. Celia's father, Archdeacon Brown, had in the meantime married Christina Johnston at Wellington in February 1860. And over the next two weeks, uh, in, in addition to officiating at several services on behalf of Brown and his assistant Charles Baker, um, he would take several photographs of the landscape around the mission station. Many of these views are immediately recognizable as having been taken from positions close to those which he had used five years earlier for his sketches and paintings. This is almost exactly the same view as the painting that I showed you earlier. This, uh, this panorama is, is, consists of two prints which um, would have been taken separately and then joined together. So they're, they're made from two separate glass plates, printed, uh, contact printed, and then joined together and mounted on card. Um, these are from the Hochstetter collection uh, uh, in Switzerland. Uh, no copies of, of these two particular uh, uh, images have been found anywhere else so far. Um, the size of the prints, which are contact prints, mean, impl which, which implies that they were printed directly from the glass plate, uh, indicates that he was now using a large format camera and he would continue to use this large for format camera for all his sub subsequent photography. Um, a second view taken from a little closer to what is now referred to as the Mission Cemetery not only illustrates his increasing competence with the camera, but also demonstrates that he was using his experience as a painter of landscapes to good effect. He was experimenting with composition, and he, that's why he tried different exposures from different viewpoints of, of what essentially was a similar subject. Here, he's tried two different exposures of the Mission Cemetery, with the silhouette of Moa positioned differently in relation to objects on the middle ground. Moa on the right hand side in this one and on the left here, um, silhouetted against um, the various trees which occupied that, that end of the peninsula. Um, you can just discern over here, not very easy on this projector image, but the graves are here with the small picket fences around each grave are there and here. And that they are in this image, or you can't see them very well, but what you can see in this image 
are sheep lying down in the shade of the midday sun. Um, right. He then moved to the other side of, of the graves and exposed two plates forming a panoramic view, looking back uh, southwest towards the mission station. So here are the graves again, and another grave down here. And Tapapa is down here, the, or rather the mission, the mission station is down, is down there. And they're not so visible in this image on the projector, but uh, in the original print you can see um, a gr grazed, uh, landscape grazed by sheep with, with fenced, fenced areas. Um, clearly they were using it um, extensively for, for livestock. Um, and then an, another view from near the tip of the peninsula. This one is taken from uh, not too far away from the previous one, but now we're looking south, directly south down the peninsula, uh, down the edge of the cliff. Uh, cliff Road is somewhere in here. Um, And so it clearly depicts the terrain as it was prior to the arrival of troops in January 1864, uh, with pre-existing, if somewhat eroded, earthworks on the position subsequently fortified as the Monmouth Redoubt there. That eventually became the Monmouth Redoubt, but troops hadn't arrived at this stage. Um, uh, those earth embankments were uh, a remnant from a, a, a par that had existed there previously. And there are some more earthworks down here. Otamataha Pa is behind the, the, view, the photographer down here. Is that a building on the extreme right skyline? Yes, that is, well, several buildings actually. Uh, I can't tell you what each of them are. Um, uh, there's one there, there's one here. There are some down here as well. There may be another one in here, I'm not particularly sure. With a, with a, a Unfortunately, the, uh, the print that we have is a copy print. The original hasn't yet been located. Um, so those are buildings. At that time, there was a schoolhouse. Uh, there was, um, oh, other people, people can probably tell you better than I can. Um, I think one of the bakers had a house there and there were a few, two or three buildings in that area. I'm not sure which is which. Um, maybe afterwards we can. The Stephanie ones, has a... The big one's the Mission Institute, which was the, the school, and then it became okay. the infirmary for the troops. And... So that, well. That one that sticks up more. That one, okay, possibly. It, does, it somehow doesn't look long enough, but as I say, the. It's quite. Yeah. That's the shape of it. Yeah, it's tall. Okay, it's tall, and, and, and as I say, the, the image is a copy, and it has been. Um, how shall I say it? Uh, the, the sky and, and the sea have, have been masked out uh, and modified, so it may have resulted in a little bit of amendment being made to the halves on the skyline as well. So that could have been changed a little bit in the print. Thank you. Okay. Then he, he moved down to the to sea level and took a view in a similar direction um, at the foot of the cliff. And you can see this dramatic cliff going all the way down to what is the strand area down here. Yeah. And, and you can see the fortifications of, of Tomata Kahawai, uh, which became the Monmouth Redoubt, up there on the top of the cliff. <coughs> okay. Uh, Kinder also exposed several plates in the vicinity of the mission house. Uh, these two uh, well-known views of the elms uh, were taken from slightly different positions in the garden. You can see one has a fuller extent of the path. That one has a an agave or something similar in the foreground. That one doesn't. But they are taken on the same occasion. I've done a careful examination of the original prints and 
In particular, there's a plant just in front of the window here that is the branches of the plant are exactly the same in both images. It's taken on the same day. But the door has been opened. This door here has been opened in between the two images. Okay, a third rather more striking view depicts a, youth, a group of young Maori girls um, arranged in front of a building which is commonly referred to as the Bakehouse. Um, and it's thought to have been sited adjacent to the elms. Uh, titles written by Kinder himself on the mounts uh, describe it variously as native girl, school, or Maori girls. Um, so this is probably the first photograph to include people taken in Tauranga ever. Um, and it marks a slight shift uh, in, in, in the emphasis of his work, particularly in regard to subjects. Um, and it, uh, uh, it's a really striking photograph. Uh, we'll, return, we'll return to that a bit later. Um, on New Year's Eve, uh, Kinder uh, accompanied Archdeacon Brown. Uh, they traveled together uh, over the Kaimans to uh, Waikato, to a place called Patetere, near um, uh, modern day, between modern day Tirao and uh, Putaruru. Uh, and they were accompanied by two young Maori men who were acting as guides. Um, they were probably on foot, I beg your pardon, just hang on on that one. Since he took his watercolours, um, but since no photographic, uh, uh, since no photographs appear to have survived, he probably didn't take his camera with him. They returned uh, to, to Papa on the 7th of January, and within the next few days, Kinder embarked on a series of photographic portraits, uh, which provide a, an intriguing uh, window into the life on the mission. <coughs> as a follow-on from this one. So this view shows the cottage that had previously uh, been occupied by Reverend Volkner. Um, he had moved on at this, at this time. Um, it's not known exactly where it was sited, um, uh, somewhere on the mission grounds. And there is a, a young Maori family arranged in front of the porch. Uh, this photograph was uh, reproduced in, in Gifford and Williams' Centennial History of Tauranga. The original uh, of print of this has not yet been located by me. Um, it's believed to have been in the Elms collection at, at one stage. But its current whereabouts is unknown. Um, Kinder then changed the lens board on his camera allowing him to uh, expose four smaller frames on a single glass plate. And he moved in closer to the porch and took a series of portraits um, of at least 11 different people, singly or, or in small groups, uh, and dressed in a variety of clothing. Uh, a note on the back of a uh, one-card mount identifies the subject as a rapana or leb leban, a biblical name, uh, as uh, one of the two Maori lads who went with us from Tauranga to Waikato, January 1863. So it's probably these two, because this chap here, which is, uh, the, that's the back of this one, and he uh, is one of these two here. Um, so it's probably these two who, who accompanied Archdeacon Brown and, and Kinder across uh, to the Waikato. Another subject has been named as Jeffet. Uh, that's that chap over there. Um, and the elder man at the lower right, uh, wearing a korowai, unfortunately it's been chopped off a little, but you can see most of it. Um, his name is Hoko Hoko uh, Tutahi. And according to Debbie McCauley on the library's Kete web pages, uh, he was from the Mangatapupa section of Natihe, Hapu of, of Nati Pukenga, uh, and was a, a, a signatory of the Treaty of Waitangi. Um, also pictured on the porch of Volkner's cottage 
are a woman who is believed to be Christina Brown. I haven't found a, uh, a portrait back, but it, which actually identifies the subject as Christina in, in contemporary hand, but that's commonly referred to. This particular one is taken from, uh, I think, the digital collection of, of, of the Elms, and it's one commonly referred to as Christina Brown. The young man on the right, uh, it's unknown who he was, uh, possibly uh, one of the... Um, uh, sorry, one, what was his name? One of the two clerks who was living in Tauranga at the time. Um, they arrived back from Auckland during Kinder's stay, so it could well have been, could well have been him. Uh, and then Kinder took a series of four portraits of Tara Pipipi uh, Te Waharoa, also known as Virumu Tamihana, or William Thompson. Um, and it seems likely that he returned with them when they came back from the Waikato, because he lived in Waharoa near, uh, he was originally from Waharoa, uh, 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 not far away from Matamata. Um, in two of the portraits, he is uh, posed in front of Archdeacon Brown's library. That's this one and the far one, far one there. And he's holding a taiaha. Um, and in the other two, he's moved into the garden uh, and is seated, in, seated or standing in front of a tree. Here he's carrying uh, a mere. And in that one, he is uh, in the act of loading a musket. Um, there's a bit of a story uh, about that one. Uh, reputedly, uh, Archdeacon uh, Brown subsequently wrote to uh, Kinder uh, with the message from Tarapipi that uh, uh, Kinder should not uh, use this portrait or publicize this portrait uh, because he didn't want to be portrayed um, in that sort of manner. Um, unfortunately, that's exactly what Kinder did. Kinder supplied the portrait uh, as the basis for an illustration which formed the frontispiece of, uh, of a book which was published within a year or two. Uh, so it has become most well known, that portrait of, of all of Kinder's portraits for exactly that reason. Uh, presumably, for uh, Widow Mutang uh role that he played in, in the land wars, and as a, as he was popularly known as the king, popularly known as the kingmaker, so he played a role there as well. Um, so, although although these portraits are uh, similar size and shape to the uh, popular carte de visite format. Uh, which had arrived in New Zealand just over a year before these portraits were produced. Uh, they became popular very quickly. But uh, So although they're very similar in size uh, and shape, um, they're taken uh, outdoors, uh, not in a studio setting. Um, and it's quite remarkable because in, in within a year of when his first portrait was taken, first known portrait was taken in 1861, within a year he's already become adept at putting his uh, subjects at ease, um, composing and framing the shots to produce what are quite intimate portraits uh, that are quite distinct from the standard studio portraits of the day. Okay. Um, so, he went back to Auckland, and although uh, Kinder made a trip northwards to the Bay of Islands in the following summer, his movements southwards were severely curtailed for much of 1863 and 1864 because of, of the unrest. In December 1864, however, well after the battles of uh, Gate Pa and Teranga, uh, John and Celia returned to to, to Papa for a stay of three or four weeks. Uh, since their previous visit, the troops had arrived in January 1864. The battles of Gate Pa and Teranga 
taken place, and the atmosphere and landscape of Tauranga had changed forever. Um, this panoramic view was made from two separate prints once again, uh, full plate, uh, full plate prints, and show uh, the Durham Redoubt over here. Should be using the pointer, but and the Monmouth Redoubt over there. Uh, soldiers' barracks over here. There's a, a house here. I think that was registered. A resident magistrate's house, perhaps. Um, I think the school building is over there, the institute. Um, and there are lots of tents scattered around the landscape. Obviously, the soldiers were a very visible presence. Um, Kinder's earlier photos, earlier photos have been restricted, unfortunately, to the end of the peninsula, so we can't compare directly what the landscape looked at this time uh, with what it had looked like a year or two earlier. Um, but Kinder was clearly trying to illustrate the changes that had taken place. Um, he returned to the Mission Cemetery, uh, where Charlotte and Marsh Brown's graves had, had been joined by those of the, the soldiers who had been killed at Gate Pa and Teranga, uh, and which were now protected by a neat picket fence. Significant difference between that and the previous portraits. The whole scene is dominated by, by the graves, not just one of many items in the landscape. Uh, Kinder had earlier sent photographs uh, as well as a reconnaissance map and a written report of military activities in the Waikato to the illustrated uh, London News, uh, who published them as engravings in November 1863. In January 1865, he visited the scenes of the recent battles at Teranga and Magatu, and perhaps he had a similar reportage in mind. This one is uh, of the site at uh, Teranga, and he marked, it's not very visible on the projector here, but there's a white spot, which would have been marked originally on the negative as a spot of black ink. That is the site of the rifle pits at Teranga. The view on the right uh, is um, supposed to show uh, the valley down which uh, uh, the the combatants from the rifle pits escaped when they were attacked. They escaped off down the valley there. And if you turn and look down to the right as you're driving um, down Pies Power Road, you can still see that view pretty much as it was in those days. Uh, several views of the fortifications at Gate Par do exist. And I'm aware that some of them have, uh, have been, uh, on occasion, attributed to Kinder. However, uh, I've been unable to verify with any certainty that any of them were actually taken by him. So you will see on the internet, in particular, uh, images of Gate Par, supposedly yeah, by Kinder. Sorry? The Gate Par, what you, you, your slide's gone back to the universe. Yeah, yeah so uh, oh, that wasn't sure. Gate Par. That's oh, why okay. I haven't I haven't included that <laughs> one because I'm not convinced that, that they are by Kinder, okay. quite possibly, but uh, uh, that remains to be seen. Um, however, he did take this view of Pukemare Pa, now named uh, or then named uh, Fort Colville, uh, after the officer in charge of the troops who were stationed there. Um, some action had taken place there in the previous uh, 12 months or so as well. Um, and you can see the huts, the roofs of the huts built by the soldiers poking up above the, the ramparts at the top there. And you can visit Bukemari Pa um, now. Uh, you, you, you take a track from where the school is in Mogatu and go up the hill and it's, it's uh, e easy to go and visit that. Um, 
While uh, Kendal was in, in Makatu, he also took the opportunity to photograph some of the very impressive wood carvings, uh, for which Makatu was, was also was already uh, well renowned. Um, this is one of the, the very striking waharoa, or, or gateways, uh, to, to the Makatu Pa. Um, on the right is a, a, a version of a similar a view of one of the gateways. I'm not sure that it's the same one, which was painted by Horatio Robley at around about the same time. Um, and Kinda chose an angle and a time of day for for the photograph, um, uh, so that the carvings were illuminated from the side, and that brought the. Um, the relief, uh, the carvings into into uh, uh, a full relief, which made them uh, easier to see. Um, this is the Te Ate uh, Pataka, also in Makatu Pa, um, which he took at the same time. Um, the Pataka is, has, uh, was subsequently dismantled and is the pieces of it, or some of the pieces of it, uh, are, are stored at uh, uh, Te Papa. Um, this image is of particular importance uh, because it shows uh, the food store and, and surrounding fenced gardens in daily use, uh, with garden implements stacked to the side. Over here to the right you can see a plough, well, not very easily here, but there's a plough, there's a spade. Uh, these on the ground, I think, are core or digging sticks. Um, there are stakes here in what appears to be a vegetable garden, and it's fenced. It's fenced at the back. It's probably the first image of uh, uh, cultivation uh, in a Maori village ever taken in New Zealand. Um, right, Kendall's return to Auckland on the 10th of January. Um, on, the, on the steamship Esk, along uh, with soldiers and officers of the 69th Regiment who were being replaced by the troops. Um, they returned to the Bay of Plenty the following summer. And in January, Kinder made an extensive tour of the thermal district around Rotorua, exposing roughly 30 photographic plates. I'm not going to reproduce any of them here because my focus is on Tauranga's as opposed to Rotorua. The only photographs that I can be sure he took in Tauranga um, are these two scenes, once again showing the cemetery. However, in the intervening 12 months, the memorial um, to soldiers of the 43rd Regiment uh, has, has been erected. And it's prominent on the skyline. There's also, in this one, the figure of someone paying their respects. So, Kinder continued to take photographs for a number of years until well into the 1870s, producing magnificent landscapes around Auckland in the Waitakere Ranges, uh, the Bay of Islands, the Coromandel Goldfields, uh, and in 1880 even on Norfolk Island. However, he apparently never returned with his camera to Tauranga. So those are the last images that he took in Tauranga, probably. So it's important to note that Kinder was an amateur rather than a professional photographer. Um, he used the medium to record the landscapes he encountered during his wanderings, probably in much the same way as he had previously done with his watercolours. There's some evidence that he used the photography as an aide de memoir for his painting. Certainly he based some of his later watercolours uh, on sketches and photographic views that he'd taken years earlier. So, for someone who wasn't a particularly wealthy man, uh, the equipment that he used, examples of which are shown here. This, this is a, a standard uh, full plate camera that would have been used in, in, in the early 1860s. And on the right is uh, also a similar camera, but with four lenses and quite possibly what he, he would have used uh, to, to take the portraits. Um, 
So although the equipment would have cost him a fairly substantial sum in terms of uh, his, his income at that time, um, that indicates that, that it wasn't a whimsical pursuit. Um, uh, and it's also important to note that he just, again, that he, he was doing this in his leisure time. He wasn't a professional. He wasn't selling any of his photographs or prints. Um, but he learned in his leisure time um, how to transpose the view that he saw in his, in his mind onto the photographic plates. That took a fair amount of, of technical skill. And he was keen enough uh, to overcome the challenges of, of lugging this, this bulky uh, equipment, and uh, heavy tripod chem chemicals and uh, glass plates around the countryside. Photography wasn't new. Uh, even collodion wet plate photography, which he was using, had been available since the early 1850s, so almost a decade. Um, and there were plenty of photographers in New Zealand using it by that time, um, by the time he bought his first camera. Um, so while he wasn't really a pioneer of the technology, uh, it's worth noting several of his, his achievements. He was the first person to take photographs in the Bay of Plenty, in the coastal Bay of Plenty, although Bruno Hamel had taken some inland in Rotorua uh, three years earlier during the 1859 Hopstetter expedition. He took at least 25 photographic scenes depicting the Tauranga landscape between 1862 and 1866. He was the first person to take photographs in Tauranga. No doubt about that. And he took at least 21 portraits of lo local Tauranga people, probably the first ever taken here. He documented the changes in landscape use after hostilities commenced in 1864. Tauranga didn't provide the dramatic landscapes that he would later encounter um, at the pink and white terraces, for example, in 1865. But the detail in his carefully composed frames uh, provides significant clues for research into that period. Uh, his scenes of battle sites can be viewed alongside those of seminal images in the Crimea by Roger Fenton. This is uh, a view of the Valley of the Shadow of Death in the Crimea, Crimea taken by Roger Fenton in 1855, 10 years earlier. Not too dissimilar to what, um, what Kinder was doing on the right there in that view of Makatu. Um, and after the Indian Mutiny by uh, Felice Beato in 1858, engraved versions of which were reproduced in the illustrated London News, which he would have seen. Uh, he took some of the earliest portraits of Maori children, as I have mentioned before, posed, but nonetheless relatively casual and informal, and not too dissimilar to images that the acclaimed John Thompson was producing at around the same time in Siam and uh, in China. That's an example of the type of work that's produced by John Thompson. Um, his documentation of, of, of wooden carvings at Makatu marked a start to a series of important early photographs of carved Maori stone figures, waka, stone posts, and farapuni. The photograph at, of the Waharo at Makatu, for example, with its use of shadow to highlight, heighten sculptural relief can be compared favorably with uh, uh, work by his contemporaries. Another photo by John Thompson uh, in Cambodia from 1866. Similar sort of subject, similar sort of treatment. So although his output wasn't large compared with uh, uh, many professional photographers, Kinder's body of work from around the Tauranga Moana is a significant visual record of the landscape from a pivotal time in our history. Uh, appre appreciation of the series of images may previously have been limited due to a poor understanding of, of Kinder's role, uh, the timing of his visits, and possibly because of poor attribution of, or documentation of some images. Uh, my study has already unearthed uh, one important image not previously attributed to Kinder. That's the one uh, looking uh, south from the Mission Cemetery down uh, towards Tomatakahawai uh, along what is now Cliff Road. 
Um, but it's almost certainly was him because at that time uh, in January 1863 there were no other photographers in Tauranga. Uh, most of the existing major collections of Tauranga of, of Kinder's photographs have been examined. Uh, but one significant group of images is as yet unlocated. I found uh, copies of many of those images, uh, later copies done in, in the 1920s. Um, but I'm still looking for the, the original collection. Um, several smaller collections that I know to exist I haven't, haven't looked at yet. But given the number of images that there are floating around, I think uh, there may well be uh, further discoveries to be made. Uh, it's perhaps unsurprising since Kinder lived in Auckland and his connection with Tauranga ceased after the death of his father-in-law in 1884 um, that so few of the original prints have ended up here. And the images have correspondingly faded somewhat from public view. Uh, as the full extent of, of the photographs Kinder took is becoming better known, it's hoped that at some stage there may be an opportunity to mount an exhibition or of a full set of high quality reproduction prints here in town. Good. Uh, that brings me to the end of the discussion. I'm happy to answer questions or go back to uh, slides that we looked at earlier, if uh, anyone. Cool, thank you very much, Brett. That was very interesting. Um, what we'll do, I'm sure there will be questions. Uh, what we'll do is we'll just hand the microphone out so that we can actually capture the question and answers on the um, recorder. So if anyone would like to answer questions, please raise your hand. Go to Ken first. Yes, thank you for your talk. I presume that he did all his own de developing of his plates and photos. Uh, yes, thank you. Yes, he would have. Uh, as an amateur, he uh, uh, he certainly would have. Um, the facilities probably weren't in existence at the time. He he certainly did develop his plates because that was the only way with 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 wet plate collection photography. You had to prepare, sensitise the plates, expose them um, straight away, um, and and then develop develop the them shortly afterwards. Um, you didn't necessarily have to print, make the prints straight away, uh, but it, the fact that almost all of his, his original prints uh, have uh, the titles and his signature at the bottom indicate that he, he's the one who printed them. Um, but that would have been sound practice in that day anyway. Uh, also the fact that he, he used scraps of cardboard, as you saw there, uh, some of the carpet of his each sized portraits that, that he produced uh, had, had uh, uh, business cards from uh, his wife's associates in Auckland. They were, they were reused as, as card marks and various other scraps we found around the house. Dorothy. Uh, you showed us some photographs early on of uh, soldiers building a road uh, south of Auckland. Um, he, am I right in thinking that he hadn't been commissioned to take those photographs, but that he was actually um, setting himself up as a, a commentator on uh, colonial uh, activities, and he was sending these photographs and articles back to London to newspapers? Yes, that's more or less correct. We don't actually know whether he was intending to set him himself up as anything. Uh, that's assumed by, by various authors. Um, we know that he took the photographs. We know that he sent them. But whether he intended anything by that, I think it's unlikely. Um, perhaps he was making a bit of pocket money from it. I don't, I, I don't know. Maybe he wasn't making anything from it. Um, I think it's important to note that, that his, he was a teacher. He was really busy during term time. He had a, a school to look after. Um, he had uh, lots of uh, uh, 
ministerial duties to attend to. This was definitely a hobby. He, I, I think it's highly unlikely he was trying to make money from it. There's no evidence that he sold any of his prints at all. Um, they, where they, most of the prints that are uh, in collections at the moment are uh, in the form of albums, some of them now dissembled, uh, which were uh, inherited by family members. Um, there are isolated prints in albums of, 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 of uh, people who were around at that time, um, probably friends of his who, who he gave the, the prints to, but no indication that it was anything else apart from that. Maria. May I just ask, would he have had any correspondence or any ideas from his contemporaries such as Frank Meadow, Sutcliffe in Yorkshire, was doing that wonderful work at the time, you know, or would he just have been lucky and saw someone else's examples in a paper like the London Illustrated? I think it's highly unlikely he would have uh, seen any photographic examples such as you're referring to um, by Sutcliffe, or I think Sutcliffe was a bit later, but as an example. He would, yeah, he, he would have... Um, he would have seen engravings uh, which were reproduced from photographs in the Illustrated London News. Uh, the technology to re reproduce photographs in those days was very limited, certainly not in newspapers. Uh, Hamel, uh, Hamel, rather, Bruno Hamel's uh, photographs from the Hochstetter expedition in 1859 uh, were reproduced as album and prints in book form. I think there's only three known copies of that to still exist. So I think Kinder saw those photographs, so that they would have been an influence. It's, it's quite an interesting story there, because um, uh, Kinder visited the uh, Lakes District, the, the Rochereur District, in 18, the summer of 1857, 1858. Hochstetter was there a year just under a year later, we know that Hochstetter and Hamel had contact with Kinder before they went. They almost certainly saw his watercolours of the, uh, uh, the pink and white terraces before they went. In turn, uh, uh, we know that Kinder sent some of his later photographs taken of Rotorua in 1865, 1866, sent copies of those to Hochstetter in Switzerland. So there, it's more likely that there would have been some uh, cross-pollination in that way um, r r oh, between friends, acquaintances, Not that sort of thing. Evidence. Yeah, unlikely they would have, we would have seen photographic prints from more famous people. Who knows whether he saw uh, some of uh, 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 Thompson's work or, or earlier work by Roger Fenton probably only as engravings. A couple of questions, one here and one at the back. What was your name, sir? Uh, Lee. Lee. Well, thanks, Brent. Uh, very interesting. On the landscape where it showed, I didn't, don't remember the year, or at, where you said the uh, Taranga was at the top. Now, that would have been taken uh, from the east. This is taken from the south, actually. From the south. Looking north. Uh, there is a as the the, the uh, sorry. Pie Road comes comes down here somewhere, uh, and, and you can, from there you can look down into the valley. This one is taken looking east, so this one is taken from over here somewhere, looking down in that direction. This one is north, and uh, the way the troops would have come in, uh, they would the, the Maori were digging their rifle pits over here, and. Uh, um, the various uh, troops came in from, from from this area here, where there's just recently been a subdivision created over here on the corner of Joyce Road, bottom end of Joyce Road. Um, that's where they would have would have come in um, from from there. So I guess north northwest. Why didn't he go up there and take an actual uh, photograph of the location? Have you have you been there? 
you try to take a photograph, it's very difficult. You, there's nothing to see, essentially. The rifle pits were filled in. There's nothing there except a field. So he was trying to give some, some relief to the landscape. That's my guess. Uh, I, I've tried. I've, I, I went to that point there to, to try and photograph the, the, um, because I have an interest in one of the, the soldiers who, who led the charge uh, down, down this end. And uh, uh, so I wanted to take a photo from where he would have started off. And really, it just it looks like nothing. Okay. So. And one at the back there. What was your name, sorry? Paul. Oh. Hi, thanks, Brett. It was an interesting talk. Um, I, just a technical question, really, um, around his uh, darkroom setup at the time, because that's the underlying narrative here with a lot of these photographs and a lot of the answers to the questions that people are asking about why didn't you go there and take that photograph. It's very, very difficult to take photographs uh, at that time because you had to have a travel in darkroom or somewhere set up um, because once these plates dried out, um, the image is rendered useless. Um, so um, when I was, I mean, there's a reoccurring view of the mountain, those cemeteries that keep reoccurring in his images, and it's almost like he's got a romantic connection to that view. Um, but I would just wonder whether there was a romantic connection to that view, or whether it's actually just within running distance to his dark room, because you know that that's that, that, that's highly possible. Like, I I I'm a white plate photographer. Um, I actually practice, um, I do the same thing that um, you know, this, this chap does, um, and I have to have a caravan. I've got a, a mobile caravan that I tow behind the car. Um, and yeah, you, the, the plate, once it, uh, it dries out, it's rendered useless. And that's probably within about 10, 15 minutes, if, if that, um, and you, you don't get an image. So I just wonder if some of these views were, um, whether he had a travel in dark room that he took around, which would be a big ask for an amateur photographer. Because uh, lots of professionals, like you saw the Fenton image of the uh, the, the valley there, he had a big um, caravan darkroom used to take around with him with wherever he went. Um, and it sounds like uh, this chap might have just been using tents or like you know um, or rooms in the vicinity. Do you have any ideas of what sort of um, darkroom setup we used at the time? We've been told as guide, we've been told as guides to the elms that um, wherever he stayed. Uh, he would put a blanket over a table, and his dark room was underneath. <laughs> Thank you, Paul, for, for your insight into um, the practice at that time. Really, very, very important. Um, I think I can't really answer your question to, with any great degree of certainty. Um, what the other lady has mentioned there earlier was in reference to um, an extract from someone who wrote about encountering uh, uh, Kinder doing this. Uh, I can't remember where it actually was, but in someone else's house they had to put a blanket over the, the dining room table and, and uh, uh, the candle he was using went out or something like that. It was a bit of a story about that. But yes, I, I think perhaps in the intervening period between 1855, 1856, when Fenton uh, was uh, taking his photographs in the Crimea and the early 1860s, uh, things had changed a little bit, perhaps not a lot, but uh, certainly by the early 1860s there were smaller portable setups available. Um, you didn't need to have a whole wagon like Fenton used. Um, uh, but I suspect he would have had an assistant. Maybe this, he had a pupil to carry his, his stuff, and, uh, or maybe he, he hired porters to carry it as well. You can't, can't imagine him going on an expedition to, to Rotorua, for, for example, and taking 30, 30 glass plates uh, and carrying, carrying those all the time himself plus all the cameras and whatever. Significant, um, uh, yeah, a significant logistical exercise. I quite get what you're saying. And we have no, unfortunately, we have no direct evidence because uh, in his memoirs, he doesn't mention photography even <laughs> once. <laughs> he talks about his painting and sketching, but doesn't mention the photography, sadly. Um, so we have to interpret. Uh, and, yeah. 
I, I can only say that you probably have a far better idea than any of us do. The interesting thing is that the photographers at the time who have the big setups with the, uh, you know, the big wagons behind, they often used to take selfies um, of, of them with their setups. So like there's a, there's a classic uh, an icon of Chris Benton with his big setup and usually there's an image of a, a setup somewhere. So it probably was just a, you know, under a table um, with a crop over the top. So that's probably what it was. Uh, and, and John Thompson has, has a similar took a similar selfie of himself on somewhere, uh, some common in London or something near, near London uh, with his with his traveling darkroom. And I think it was more like a cart, like a two wheeled cart, which he dragged. Um, similarly, uh, I know in, in Derbyshire in England, um, there was a, a prominent early photographer by the name of Richard Keane, who, uh, uh, with his friend Alfred Warwick, went on a ramble in the 1850s around Derbyshire. Uh, and they took a cart with them too, with glass plates. Um, similar sort of thing. I think a cart is more likely. Um, although, yeah, I don't know, in the terrain around Tarana, you know. Yeah. Any yeah, other questions? Brian? Would it be correct to say that he was the first uh, photographer in the Bay of Plenty? <coughs> Uh, thank you, Brian. Yeah, uh, not quite uh, in Coastal Bay of Plenty, <laughs> because Bruno Hamel on the Hoxted expedition two years earlier, or two or three years earlier, um, that they went through the Waikato, crossed over through to, to Rotorua, took photographs around there. They came through to the coast, but took no photographs from Makatu through to Tauranga and then over the Komais. Well, no photographs survived. So either he didn't have the, maybe he sent his, his photographic equipment uh, back from, from Rotorua back to Auckland and went on without it, or, or none of the photographs came out or, or whatever. None of, n no photographs from the expedition include views of, of Tauranga and the coastal Bay of Plenty. So yes, to answer your question, uh, he was almost certainly, I, I can't be categorical about it because it, until, until we find another photographer who was working, who, who visited the Bay of Plenty at that time, we have no evidence that there was anyone else. I have to say that he was, he was the first. Yeah. Any other questions? What was your name, sorry? Murray. Murray. Did the military ever use those photographs or get access to the photographs of... Um, of Drury? Um, not that I'm aware of. Uh, I know that they did use a, a map that he produced in 1864, 1863. He went south to Mangatafere uh, with documenting taking photographs of soldiers, encampments, etc. And he produced a map, which I think was was used by, by the military, but I, uh, I don't think it was specifically created for that, but who knows. It, yeah. Final questions? Yes, Stephanie. I just wondered if there's any indication of how kinder prints ended up in Switzerland, if there's any provenance to those uh, particular prints. Uh, thanks, Stephanie. Yes, absolutely. Uh, they are in the collection uh, belonging to the family of Ferdinand Hochstetter, who Conduct, he came, visited New Zealand and was um, tasked with doing a survey in New Zealand uh, in 1859. He made a lot of contacts in Auckland before he went back and maintained correspondence with those contacts and kin Kinder subsequently sent many of these photographs to him uh, and there's correspondence documenting all of that. Yeah, yeah. Sasha Nolden, who, who works at, at Alexander Turnbull Library, the National Library, um, has written two two books about about the Hoxteder collection. Very interesting. If you can get them on interlibrary loan, really worth worth looking at. Uh, and uh, they have.
have they contain photographs uh, and, and uh, copies of, of uh, watercolors and photographs of watercolors, including one by Kinder, um, from a number of different people who were active at the time. And some of those, as I've shown, uh, some of those photographs don't exist anywhere else. Um, so Kinder may have sent the only prints that he had, he, the other ones may have vanished, who knows. But uh, um, yeah, that's documented quite well. No other questions? I was going to say, any of the Robert. Glass, any of the glass plates, where are they stored? The glass plates, where are they stored? Uh, thanks, Robin. Um, yeah, that's an interesting one. Several uh, previous researchers uh, have talked about this matter, and uh, <sighs> I'll, I'll elaborate this on a little bit, if you'll bear with me. Um, in the 1920s, there was a, a chap in Auckland by the name of James Richardson, who carried out a lot of work preserving uh, Auckland's history, uh, the photographic history of Auckland. He collected together uh, copies of photographs from all over Auckland and further afield, Auckland province, really. And that included a number of uh, uh, kinder images, which he copied. Um, most of most of uh, Richardson's work is either at the uh, uh, the Auckland Library in the search, the George Gray collection, or at the Auckland Museum. Um, and several previous researchers have looked at those uh, copies some as copy negatives, some as copy prints, and have come to the conclusion that Richardson had access to Kinder's original glass plate negatives. Um, I have looked at a much smaller set of those negatives uh, because my focus is on Tauranga, uh, and I can find no evidence that any of them have been taken from glass plates. Uh, I'm not saying yet. <laughs> that uh, he didn't have access to any glass plates. Um, but I, my impression is that it's unlikely. All, all the copy prints that I've seen come from, from other prints, not from negatives. Um, so as far as I'm aware, there are no glass plate negatives in existence. There's no original glass plate negatives in existence. There are glass plate negatives, but they are ones that Richards have made and are copy, copies of prints. This raises another little issue, which is uh, quite a few of, of Richardson's copies are of prints that don't seem to exist anywhere. So there is a whole collection of prints somewhere which has gone missing. We don't know where they are at the moment. They could be in an, institute, in an institution somewhere. They could be in private hands. But when he did those prints in the 1920s, there was another collect, significant collection of Kinder's works uh, which existed, which he copied. And I know this because m many of those prints actually uh, are a larger aerial extent than any of the existing prints that we have. So they cover a slightly larger area. So there are details along the edge of those prints, which aren't in included in any other prints that we know of. So if anyone knows of any other kind of prints out there and might, or might be able to provide clues to this other collection of prints, that would be a really important find. Thanks for allowing me to <laughs> diverge a little from your question. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, folks, and thank you very much to Brett for uh, taking the time to share the, uh, the fruits of your research over many years. Um, it's been an incredibly interesting talk, um, and I'd just like to invite everyone to join us in thanking Brett for the talk. Um, just a couple of final words from me. Um, 
So this uh, presentation has been recorded and it's all uploaded to YouTube uh, if you'd like to watch it again um, or if you'd like to share it with other people who weren't able to make it today. Um, also, we've got a, an exhibition on here at the Elms um, at the moment. It, it opened yesterday. Um, it's going to be on until the 24th of October. Please um, come and have a look through. It's an amazing um, uh, exhibition involving nine artists across seven different projects in the rooms of the, the house and the library. For local people, only $7.50. Or um, if you want to become a supporter of the Elms Foundation, $25 per annum, you get in for free. Um, uh, it's uh, nine really um, nationally renowned artists um, who have done amazing, amazing things with those spaces. Um, and finally, please come and join us for a cup of tea in the Fencible. Um, there's a, a jug boiling over there, so um, it would be great to continue the conversation over in the Fencible. Thank you, folks.